Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to Brain Scratch. Hope you're having a wonderful Friday. Today is January 12th, 2018. Ah, the year's moving along at a great clip already. Uh, I wanted to do what I consider a little bit of an old school brain scratch. I went all the way to the top of the suggestions list and started going back down. uh, And I bumped into something that turned out to be a pretty interesting topic for me. Hope you enjoy it as well. You know, we've looked into several cases where there has been some type of mysterious cipher left behind. I think probably the most famous one that we uh, hear about the most often is certainly the Zodiac Killer. But we've got a little bit of a twist in that this cipher is tied to a hidden buried treasure, almost like the Fen treasure story that we've also covered. Um, But this isn't just a poem. This is a full on cryptic cipher that needs to be decoded. So maybe you can find where I think something like over uh, $40 million worth of gold, silver and jewels might be buried. Sound interesting to you? Sure was to me. Let's take a look at it together. Uh, Here we have a look at one of the ciphers. There was three that were left behind. Uh, The first one is, it says the locality, but it's the location of where the vault is that stores all these wonderful riches. The second one was basically a description of what is in the vault. And the third one is supposedly the partners that helped collect all these riches and move them there and their next of kin so that um, they could be the the riches could be shared with everyone, which kind of raises a question in itself. Why do these guys go and bury all of their wealth in one spot? And why didn't they start divvying it up and getting it back to their families when they could enjoy it? Uh, I don't know. Just one of the many interesting questions we're going to bump into in this case. Let's start with Wikipedia just to get a little bit of, a, of an idea about what this is about. The Beale ciphers, also referred to as the Beale papers, are a set of three cipher texts, one of which allegedly states the location of a buried treasure of gold, silver, and jewels estimated to be worth over $43 million as of January 2017. I've heard some differences in that. I've heard all the way up to $60 million. Uh, comprising three cipher texts. The first, unsolved text, describes the location. The second, the content of the treasure. And the third, lists the names of the treasure's owners and their next of kin. Um, now, the Beale Papers is another interesting aspect to this. Uh, essentially... Someone released this in a pamphlet, and here we actually see the cover of the pamphlet that was sold, and you can see the price on it was 50 cents, which according to one of these articles in today's money is approximately about $13. So certainly not a cheap pamphlet, but with the promise of you being able to look into it, um, decode these messages, and possibly find hidden treasure, you know, 13 bucks probably wasn't too bad of a a bit of money to to put down on something like that. Uh, Let's jump over to cyphermysteries.com to learn more about the pamphlet. In 1885, a short pamphlet was published. It claimed to record a letter written in 1822 by a Thomas Jefferson Beale to a Mr. Morris, which in turn claimed to contain three encoded texts uh, describing the location, the beneficiaries, and basically the treasure, uh, and that it was hidden in Bedford County, Virginia during 1819 and 1821. The pamphlet includes a decoding of the second message. So this is this is kind of interesting. You have um, three messages. The second one has been decoded, but if you remember the order that I keep repeating to the, these things to you in, the second one is a description of the treasure. So for people that might be looking at this saying, hey, is this a hoax? I think it's kind of interesting that that happens to be the message that has been decrypted. Uh, The third message is probably the most meaningless, especially this far away from uh, the actual event happening. Uh, And even if someone decoded the first one, are they really going to care to decode the third one so they could share that wealth with all these other people that might have some claim to it? I kind of doubt it. But... um, It's interesting. We do have the fact that the second one is cracked, and it is cracked using the Declaration of Independence, which is kind of an interesting twist in this as well that we'll we'll get a little more into. Uh, It should be no surprise then that since countless Beale treasure hunters have trawled the historical archives for references to the people involved but with relatively little success, uh, hunted for texts that might have been used as the code books 
also with little success, and have raked over Bedford County with old maps, metal detectors, and occasionally digging machines. Similarly, similarly unsuccessful. Um, I really like how uh, this person is is writing the article here. Um, what's almost more interesting, at least on this website, than the description of the Beale papers is the conversation that goes on below it. Um, there are people claiming to have solved it. There are people debunking what they have said. It's kind of an interesting read. Treads into some kind of nerdy areas in terms of cryptography, um, but definitely entertaining. Uh, if you want to get into this, I highly recommend that you check that out, but particularly check out the comments uh, on this page over at cyphermysteries.com. Moving over to the epochtimes.com, we get a little more detail. So uh, Beal had about 30 partners in what, what it seems like was kind of a gold mining operation that they had put together um, that was taking place in Santa Fe. But for some reason, they were trucking it all the way back to Bedford County. Uh, if you read the letter, there, there's some explanation why they were doing it there. They, they felt like that was a safer area. Um, I'm not sure if that's really the truth of the matter or if that is just something that uh, is kind of written as... Um, as a fictional piece to fill in the logic of why they would move literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. We're talking, I think on the two separate loads, about 2,000 pounds each being trucked all the way from Santa Fe uh, back to Bedford County. So kind of raises a question in itself. Why wouldn't they just, you know, start spending the money, move local, move their families out there, keep the mining operation going for their whole lives, hand it off to their kids? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, but we get a little more detail here about the letters. So the encoded letters were placed into an iron box and then given to what this article is referring to as a trusted friend, the local innkeeper named Robert Morris. Uh, unfortunately, then Beals disappeared. All his partners disappeared. They were never seen from again. Robert Morris had been given instructions that after 10 years, he was okay to go ahead and open the box. Uh, he actually waited something like 23 years before opening the box, but he eventually did open it up. And then he spent many years of his life trying to decipher the codes, but he was unsuccessful. Before he died, Morris gave the papers to an unnamed friend, and he too spent decades working on the decryption of the messages. Another point in this story where things get to the point of kind of rattling my believability. Um, we have such good documentation about, uh, particularly about Robert Morris that comes through the pamphlet. We get a little bit of history about uh, Beale. But now we have this character that remains completely unnamed, and they kind of write in this reasoning that his life was so ruined by him trying to um, solve this and find the treasure. You know, he literally lost all his family, didn't take care of things at home, uh, just completely wrecked his life trying to do all this. But then he hands it over to someone that goes and publishes a pamphlet on it. It feels like a bit of a loose connection in terms of, of the logic of what's going on with this story for me. But that is as it's told. We have a mystery person that is the most recent person to have these materials right before this pamphlet gets published. So uh, jumping over to MysteriousWritings.com, they wrote uh, 10 interesting facts about the lost Beale treasure. Um, the main one that I wanted to cover here is that the old chimney of Buford's Tavern still stands. And apparently that is where Mr. Morris was working. That is where uh, Beals kind of fell in love with this area, decided to come back to this area and to bring all this gold there. And supposedly, according to what was deciphered in the second text, uh, it is about four miles from this area to where this vault is hidden. So uh, kind of interesting to me. And I'm wondering in some way, could this pamphlet have been written to try to promote travel to this area? maybe for innkeepers to make more money, possibly. Uh, I don't think uh, Morris would have benefited from that directly, but maybe the person that published it, maybe they had something to do with the local tourism industry in some way. I don't know. I just think it's kind of interesting that they pick this spot in particular and then say, yeah, within four miles of here, you know, you're going to find a million kajillion dollars in gold and silver and jewels. Uh, by the way, here's a nice inn that you can stay at and here's a tavern you should hang out at. It's, it's really... 
I don't know. It's it's kind of itching my brain in a couple of different places in terms of could this really be happening or are there benefits to creating this story and whipping this up? Uh, I mean, beyond the 50 cents that you're selling per pamphlet, which, you know, if I was going to spend 13 bucks on, uh, <laughs> on a pamphlet, I'd wanted to have some pretty solid information in it. Uh, over at the unmuseum.org, the Museum of Unnatural Mystery, um, they have what I have found to be a reprint of the actual Beale Papers. One of the few places I've been able to find that actually kind of went word for word on it. I have read through the whole thing from top to bottom. Uh, and I have to tell you that looking at it, I, I'm, I feel kind of fortunate that I also do movie reviews on this channel. Kind of keeps my brain sharp about narratives and about storytelling and stuff like that. Um, there is something about the way this is written, which really starts feeling fictionalized to me. Uh, it does feel like storytelling. It's really enjoyable. It's kind of a, a fun read. I really recommend that you guys check it out if you have some time to dive into it. Kind of feels like this old rustic, you know, cowboy tale. But when I look at it structurally, I'm wondering why so much so many pages and so many words are being dedicated to certain things. And I'll tell you, a lot of it is dedicated to Mr. Morris and what an amazing guy he was. And I believe that the author of this thought that that was an important fact because he needed to justify why Beals was going to leave this with this innkeeper. And the strange thing is, if you read through the accountings here, there is no previous relationship between Beals and the innkeeper. There are literally, I think, two times where they meet up. So you have to believe that within those two periods of time that for some reason, Beals said, well, this guy's awesome enough. We're going to <laughs> literally give him the keys to this kingdom and trust that he will you know, sit on it for 10 years and not do anything. Uh, other important things that come out here are you learn that there was supposed to be a key that was sent to Mr. Morris at some point, but that never appeared to happen. Uh, and that is another important thing. The way it's described in this paper, there is, it doesn't mention multiple keys. It says the key and it says it in a few places. Um, so what I'm kind of wondering is, did the writer not quite get this right? Was it the writer's intent that people would think that the Declaration of Independence should also be used for deciphering the other two? Um, I, I really don't know, but I'm kind of caught by that because the assumption now, if you go looking at all these different people that have kind of been drilling into this mystery, is that there is a different, uh, some type of different key out there, that it wasn't just the Declaration of Independence. Maybe um, there's a book or something else that lines up with how these numbers break out to letters. And it just after reading this, I never got that. I never got that. And there are exactly quoted letters from Beals to Morris here where Beals is specifically stating the key, not the keys, not one of the keys, the key to all three letters is specifically stated in here. So kind of makes me wonder um, about it and about if those other letters can really be uh, decoded or not. And I know a lot of people wonder that. There's basically, you got communities that are split right down the middle. There are people that think this is a hoax, people that think it isn't, people that think that this was written by the person that actually published it. Um, it it's kind of interesting. Let's jump back to the Wikipedia real quick and I'll give you just a little more detail. Yeah, many arguments that the entire story is a hoax. There was a scholarly analysis done in 1982 by Joel Nickel. Uh, he tried to use historical records. He couldn't confirm the existence of Thomas J. Beale. Of course, I'm seeing other things where local historians say that they do confirm the existence of several Thomas Beals in the area. Um, I really don't know who to believe more in that. You've got a local historian versus someone that is doing a scholarly analysis. But um, it's also worried about how the documents are written. It's saying that they couldn't have been written at the time that was alleged because there was words used in the documents that didn't become popular uh, until later. Uh, two words, an example, one of them is stampeding, and I believe the other word is improvising, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, also, they did an analysis on the writing style and you know, that's what's interesting about how the paper is written. You have um, the author that's writing this thing up, but he is quoting letters uh, word for word from Beale 
Um, so you're able to at least see if there is distinct voices going on between uh, you know, the letters that are being quoted and then the rest of the writing. I didn't detect any distinct voice there. It kind of felt like all the same voice to me. And according to the analysis that was done for uh, this scholarly analysis, they're also saying the same thing, that it seems like the writing style is consistent and that it's probably James B. Ward, the person that actually published these uh, pamphlets. And it also notes that he was a Mason himself. He was part of the Freemason organization, which is known for keeping secrets. And, you know, that might be something to do with why he's involved with cryptography in this kind of way. So... So over at BealTreasureStory.com, um, they bring up a really interesting question. How was cipher number two actually cracked, particularly when it seems like Beale did not do a great job of counting? Uh, essentially, every word in the Declaration of Independence uh, became its own number. And then you would take the first letter from that word, and that's the letter that you're supposed to use when you're cracking this thing. That means you have to count every single word that's in the Declaration of Independence. It has to have a corresponding number. There were as many as five or six errors, counting errors by Beale. Now, the problem is, as soon as you have one counting error, essentially all the numbers after you've goofed that count have shifted. So none of the words following that number should be decoding properly. They should turn into complete gibberish. And that's only if you had one error. There were five or six in there. Uh, what's really interesting here is this author um, does a good, really good job of kind of looking at it from both sides and then theorizing that even if there were numerous errors in this key, the author of the pamphlet might have been able to figure it out, uh, and here's how. The start of the message uh, uses relatively no, low number values. So that's kind of one of the benefits, right? The lower the number value, the less likely that he got his count wrong and everything up to that point should work kind of okay. And if you'll look here, you'll see that I've highlighted several uh, that don't work right. We've got um, the word I, and this should be have, but we see there's an R in there. So we know that 807 is broken for some reason. Uh, the word deposited, but we see that the I has been replaced with a C, so we know 647 is broken. So essentially, the author is concluding that if you got enough of the structure proper, like we did here where we could see the example, we could correct the ones that are broken. You could essentially look back at the key and say around 807, hey, one of these words needs to start with an R. Which one is it? Oh, look, it's actually you know three characters before. So there was some kind of counting error. Shift everything back three characters, and then we're able to continue and move forward from there. So theoretically, the guy that wrote the pamphlet could have still cracked this code, could have corrected the counting errors. And he actually published his own version of the Declaration of Independence with the counts happening uh, in it as part of the pamphlet. Now, it does still leave you with a question of how come he didn't explain all this in the pamphlet? Maybe he thought that it would bore people or that it w really wasn't that important. Obviously, I don't know that this guy was thinking that, uh, you know, over 150 years later that people were still going to be looking into this, wondering about this mystery. So maybe uh, he didn't exactly note everything that he should have. Um, but it does raise an interesting question. Did he really solve this and fix it or... Is he the guy that made the code in the first place? And that's why he was able to uh, crack it with no problem, because essentially he had a badly numbered copy of the Declaration of Independence to start with. Kind of interesting. Uh, hopefully not too nerdy for you guys out there. Uh, there was also a man named Jim Galugli uh, that did an analysis, I believe in the early 80s. Uh, he is a cryptography person. He's into that stuff. Uh, and he noticed a problem with the first letter. Essentially, if you took the same key that cracked the second letter and applied it to the first letter, there was a few interesting things that happened. Number one is several repeating characters, which if this is written English, uh, it doesn't make sense that you would have several repeating characters like that of, of, of the same letter. Now, I don't know that that really um, does a whole lot for me because 
the several repeating characters are not based on the same number. It's not like the letter T only had one number associated with it. He used multiple numbers for the letter T. He would just find several instances in the Declaration of Independence where a word started with T, but he wouldn't just find the first one and use that same number over and over. He'd use the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. So if this is pure jumble here, um, I do believe that having repetitive letters is somewhat possible. I don't know what the statistical probability of it is, but I do believe it's possible and it could be a natural occurrence. What I struggle with, and he did as well in terms of being a natural occurrence, is this string right here, which looks a lot like A, B, and it should be C, but there's an F, D, E, F, G, H, I, there's an extra I, J, K, L, M with an extra M, N, O, with an H after it, and then two Ps. It certainly seems like in the middle of this letter, if it is using the same cipher key, that someone kind of got lazy about writing gibberish and just started going through the letters and picking numbers going, give me an A, give me a B, give me a C, give me a D, give me an E, give me an F. Um, and what's interesting here is he actually did the work of understanding what the chances of that string occurring are. And granted, it's not perfectly the, the alphabet, but it's very, very strong in terms of its structure. It seems to me like it's someone reciting the alphabet. The chances of that appearing at random, he calculates would be about one in a million million, which puts it at pretty steep odds for me. Uh, so much so that some experts, which um, there was an episode of Expedition Unknown where they looked into this as well. And the host went to, uh, I believe he said it was the NSA that, that he went to and talked to a cryptographer there. This guy wrote a program that basically used the Declaration of Independence uh, as a key automatically against the numbers. Uh, you know, it, it decoded the second letter like it was supposed to, but he also notes that it had five or six errors that needed to be corrected. And he then applies that same key to the first letter. He notices the same thing with basically the ABCs being right in the middle of it. And for him, that's enough for him to say hoax, that this just these letters are likely random gibberish. The guy got bored in the middle, started going through his ABCs. Uh, who knows? It could be names of his family that are all around that. Um, it's, it's hard to determine. Actually, I guess if it was the names of his family, we would at least see some of it. Uh, breaking out here, but we don't have the benefit in this letter that we did in the second letter of having those low value numbers where you could potentially correct if there's key problems. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. But according to this expert, he's relatively convinced it's a hoax. Um, I'm going to have a couple of other links for you guys if you want to jump into this a little more down below. Bealtreasure.net uh, has a bit of an interesting uh, story on it goes into the codes quite a bit. And, you know, there's even Beal Solved out there, which according to this website, which looks like it was made on GeoCities sometimes around, sometime around 1996, uh, the Beal ciphers were not a hoax. The locality cipher does indeed disclose the exact location of the hidden vault. And we've even got a picture of the vault here, but no treasure was found in it. Um, which does leave me with an interesting question here. If, if this is true, which I, I, I even looked into like the plausibility of him moving this much weight, you're talking thousands and thousands of pounds of materials. Uh, could he have moved those on just a, uh, a wagon basically, or a, a prairie schooner? Uh, and according to Google, absolutely. Um, they weighed about 1,300 pounds, and it was the goal to keep the cargo at no more than 2,000 pounds, which if you look at the actual letter that's written out, the weight is actually spelled out for each load, and they kind of stuck to that. So that the story is holding up in terms of some of those types of facts. Where I struggle is just the reasoning. The reasoning why this man is going to move his wealth across the country instead of move whatever is important to him towards the wealth, if he had family, move them all over there. You've got literally millions of dollars that you're dealing with and you're just working this area for more and more gold. Why aren't you going to move your family out there? If you don't have family, then it makes even less sense for you to move this back 
somewhere else. You've got the consideration of having 30 partners that for some reason agree, hey, let's bury this stuff and let's write an encrypted letter and leave it with a random innkeeper. Now, the story... Uh, as it's written in the pamphlet, tries to even address that, saying that these men were working in almost like a military type fashion, that they had uh, agreed that Beale was to be their leader and that they were going to follow whatever he said, that they trusted him to find the person that they trusted enough to leave all this information with. The pamphlet really tries to explain all the doubts away, and it works very hard at doing so, which for me in itself is a little bit of a warning indicator that this might be fiction, that the author was so worried about the believability, he spent way too much time trying to justify the believability of this story. But let's say that this is real, 30 guys. What are the odds that one of those guys would have spoken to his family, maybe left a letter of his own? Hey, if you don't hear from me uh, you know, in five years, go and dig this stuff up. It's in this area. Um, why would they have kept their promise uh, when they don't have access to that money for their family? The, the logic of it, once again, is is defying me quite a bit. Then, please keep in mind, this is uh, pre-Civil War when, when uh, supposedly this stash has been made. And you go into the Civil War, and all of a sudden, we have troops that are crawling and traipsing all over our country. Is it possible that the stash was found by someone else and that they took it? Uh, I think there is a possibility of that as well. Uh, if it, I mean, that's once again, assuming that if it actually existed in the first place, which I don't know, guys, based on that pamphlet, I'm really struggling with. Uh, I think it's fun. It was kind of fun to watch the episode of uh, Destination Unknown to just, or Expedition Unknown, sorry, just to see like what a search like that is about. Uh, and the host, Josh Gates, even kind of says at the end of the episode that uh, he feels like it was a worthwhile search, even though he now believes it's debunked and that it's a hoax because of the time he got to spend outdoors. You know, he was river rafting. They're using metal detectors. They're sitting around a fire at night, listening to guitar and drinking moonshine. Uh, it was really more about the chase than the actual treasure, which I think in a lot of these hidden treasure scenarios that we've talked about on, on the channel, um, there has to be some value given to that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Would I go out and look for it? No, I'm probably more of the type to try to crack the code, <laughs> to sit here in my office and just work for hours uh, trying to figure, figure out this code. But quite honestly, um, with technology where it's at right now, we, I mean, we have programs, we have computers dedicated to cracking mysteries like this. They can't crack that code. We have experts telling us it looks like this could be faked. Um, I don't know that I would spend a whole lot of time doing that. But the story behind it is really interesting. The pamphlet, if you do look at it as a piece of fiction is a pretty fun read. It, it's a pretty interesting piece of fiction. I really enjoyed getting through it. it. It kept me glued to it. As soon as I started it, I didn't stop until I got all the way to the bottom. Uh, and then it made me look into it a bunch more. So if nothing else, I'd say check out the link down below, unmuseum.org or unmuseum.org. I'm not sure what they call it. Uh, give the letter a read for yourself and maybe make up your own mind about it. Do you think that it's real? Do you see the same points I do where it seems like the logic of the story is being accounted for in a really heavy fashion and the actual uh, pieces to find the treasure are extremely slim, except for a really good description of what the treasure is. Oh, and by the way, for some reason, the second letter also includes you know what state and county it's in but there's a whole letter dedicated to the exact location. I'm, I'm really not sure. If I was going to have one letter written about the location, I probably wouldn't have put the state and county in the decoded second letter. I probably would have kept it in the first, but uh, I don't know what the thinking was behind uh, Mr. Beal here. And uh, I don't know, that's just me. Thank you so much for hanging out for this brain scratch. Hope you guys had a little fun with this one. I know that I did. All the links are in the description box below if you want to check out some of this stuff for yourself. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you back here on Monday, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.